In this presentation, I will talk about quantum spin and a new and deeper examination of what spin is. Presently, a spin one-half is viewed as a vector quantity, a point particle, described as intrinsic angular momentum. Indeed, this is what measured spin is, two states of up and down in a magnetic field or when approaching a polarizing filter. The first part of this talk describes this spin. Since this description comes from the Dirac equation, I call it Dirac spin. The second part gives an extension of spin, which is new and leads to surprising results. It gives a deeper and physically credible view of spin, a view which is mathematically sound. This spin, we call quaternion or Q-spin, has structure, which replaces the point particle. Here is a view of Q-spin. It is geometrically equivalent to a photon. The axis of linear momentum spins, which is generated by a unit quaternion. The attribute that does the spinning is the hyperhelicity, which is observed as the usual helicity that is measured. Hyperhelicity is the complementary property to spin polarization. The structure is formed from two orthogonal axes of spin angular momentum seen here. These two components are mirror states, like the matter-antimatter pair Dirac proposed. However, here they are two axes on the same particle. The two spin oppositely to maintain their mirror property and superpose to produce a spin of magnitude 1. That is, in free flight, a spin 1 half becomes a boson formed from the coupling of the two spins of 1 half. Note, however, that the helicity spins this polarization so that it is averaged away. In free flight, Spin is a spinning two-dimensional disk of polarization with zero net angular momentum, but it remains a boson until measured. Here again are the two orthogonal spin components coupled to give a spin of one. When it encounters a polarizing field, the spin one starts to decouple so that one axis is pulled more strongly to the field direction and aligns while its partner is averaged by the spinning. Here is shown the two possible ways the boson decouples, and this depends upon the orientation of the filter relative to the spin. One or the other aligns, and the boson is destroyed. This is a spin of one half and a fermion. The helicity stops, and the system becomes polarized, being the usually observed Dirac spin. This description epitomizes the wave-particle duality of spin, which has hitherto been missed. Like position momentum and energy time, so angular momentum has two complementary properties, polarization and coherence, or the helicity. The two attributes are in different spaces and do not commute. It is the purpose of this video to explain the origin of spin structure and to discuss some of the changes that result. Here are some consequences. The matter-antimatter interpretation Dirac proposed is replaced by two spin axes on the same particle. Q-spin resolves the negative energy problem that Dirac encountered. Non-locality is replaced in favor of local realism. The violation of Bell's inequalities, interpreted as evidence for non-locality based upon Bell's theorem, is replaced by the correlation due to the hyperholicity. A spin is one particle in the four-dimensional Dirac field of Q-spin, whereas Dirac spin is two dimensions of spin up and down. A spin is not a point particle of intrinsic angular momentum, but rather a two-dimensional structured particle. The intrinsic angular momentum of spin 
becomes extrinsic. Being a two-dimensional spinning plane, Q-spin is also an anion, which supports the transition from a boson to a fermion upon measurement, then back to a boson after leaving the filter. Before presenting Q-spin, I will review the usual description of Dirac spin, which is measured spin. We usually encounter spin in high school with the electronic structure of the periodic table. We learn the Pauli exclusion principle that electrons in orbitals must be paired into up and down singlet states. We have a visualization of two opposing bar magnets with north-south and south-north stuck together like spins up and down. Spin was discovered in the 1920s by Stern and Gerlach, who sent a beam of silver atoms through an inhomogeneous magnetic field. The inhomogeneity is required to couple the linear and angular momentum, which gives rise to a deflection. The direction of the deflection depends upon whether the spin is in the up or down state, that is, whether it is spinning left or right. The usual approach is to assert that all we know is what we measure. So we know we have two states from a spin one-half in a stern gerlach experiment. From the experimental evidence, we construct spin. The beam of silver atoms splits into two states with different energies, and spins carry angular momentum of plus or minus one-half h-bar. Quantum mechanics says that observations must define states and Hermitian operators. So we represent the two states by state functions, and since the experiment is done in the laboratory fixed frame in the z direction, we write these two states as plus or minus in the z direction. We then define a Hermitian operator that gives the outcomes of experiments. Let's drop the h bar over 2 and write sigma z operating upon the state gives plus or minus 1. It is easy to show that these two states form a two-dimensional spin space, and we can satisfy the experiment from the eigenvalue equations here. These operators allow us to recover from the states the plus or minus one values which are observed. The observed properties of spin are expressed by the Pauli spin matrices. There is nothing special about the z direction, and the experiment can be done in any orientation, giving an eigenvalue equation in the direction of a unit vector n, which is defined here, and for theta equal to zero, we recover n equal to z. So the component of spin in any direction is given by the dot product between a sigma vector and the direction of the unit vector. And without giving the details, we soon get the usual result that the Pauli spin component sigma z is a component of the Pauli spin vector sigma given here in the laboratory fixed frame. The states are flexible up to a phase, and this is what most people use. The z states are recovered when the angles are zero. Here we see that when theta phi equals zero, we get the two states, plus z and minus z. These are called basis states. These states are normalized and orthogonal, and the three Pauli spin matrices are given by sigma z, sigma x, and sigma y, which are also orthogonal and normalized. These obey the commutation relationships given here. The commutation relationship is given by 2 times epsilon i sigma k. i sigma k is a bivector. Epsilon i j k is a third rank, totally anti-symmetric Levi-Civita tensor. The square of any two Pauli spin matrices is the identity. This about sums up a spin of one half as measured. That is, we have understood the stern gorak experimental results, which is the goal of physics. Identified and defined, a spin is a two-state property of intrinsic angular momentum carried by the particles. 
to relate to what we measure, put back Planck's constant and define the spin operator for a spin one half as one half h bar times the Pauli spin vector. So we get the observed angular momentum from the state in the eigenvalue equation here. Once again, the nth component of the spin operator is the contraction between it and the unit vector in the n direction. The easy find spin of one half with a quantum number s equals one half. Spin fits into the usual equations that all angular momentum obey. The number of states is 2j plus 1, which for spin of 1 half gives 2. And the magnitude is the square root of the dot product between the two spin operators, giving root 3 over 2 times h bar. This is spin as defined in quantum mechanics. Spin is interpreted as a point particle and called intrinsic angular momentum because a point particle can have no angular momentum. Spin is universally considered to be always in polarized states, like these little bar magnets pointing up and down. Spin can be displayed as a point on the block sphere, with the plus and minus partners as antipodal points. The north and south poles are antipodal points of spin in the z-direction. Any spin state can be written as a superposition of any two antipodal points. We usually use the laboratory fixed frame in the z direction and write any state in the direction n as a superposition of the two basis states. These states form other points on the block sphere. A qubit is a superposition of two spin states of up and down. That is, a qubit is composed of only polarized states. Pauli spin matrices form a non commutative Lie group. SU2. This is homomorphic, that is, it maps 2 to 1, to the rotation group, SO3, and isomorphic to the quaternion group. Spin has a firm mathematical basis. It explains almost everything we measure. The block sphere gives a simple visualization. Spin is generalized to give states of different spin values using Klebsch Gordon coupling and this builds spins of higher integer and half integer values. A spin one half plays a role in almost every area of science. Bonding to spectroscopy, the structure of matter, quantum information theory, and many, many more. So far, spin has been described based upon applying the postulates of quantum mechanics. In addition, spin arises naturally from the Dirac equation using quantum field theory in space-time. Dirac derived his equation by linearizing the Klein-Gordon equation, which is a second-order differential equation, by requiring mass and energy to be conserved. He obtained the following first-order differential equation. This has four dimensions, time and three spatial components. The linearization can only be accomplished if the four gamma matrices are four-dimensional and anti-commute. The gamma matrices represent the Dirac field of a spin one-half. However, Dirac expected to find two states, that is, the two-state spin that we have discussed up to here. A closer look reveals two spins, not one, in the four-dimensional Dirac field. One was just what he wanted, and the second was the mirror image twin of the first. Dirac had found two spins, not one. What was the second spin? The problem is the twin has negative energies that go to minus infinity, and these cause a problem as to its meaning. It could not be ignored, and finally Dirac suggested the second spin is the antimatter twin of the measured two-state spin. This was quite radical at the time, but it was finally accepted when some antimatter was discovered. Now the matter-antimatter description is the accepted interpretation. Recall at the beginning of this presentation, I said that Q-spin has structure arising from two orthogonal spin axes. 
these axes replace the matter-antimatter interpretation of Dirac. There are some other bothersome issues with the Dirac spin. Dirac spin is a point particle, yet it has angular momentum. This is dismissed by calling spin intrinsic, or not revealed angular momentum. To make angular momentum extrinsic, a spin needs structure. I mentioned helicity, which is unobservable in our space-time. It is a measure of the spinning axis, but spin has no axis about which to spin. So how can helicity exist? Spin plays a major role in the foundations of quantum mechanics and in EPR coincidence experiments. These show the Bell's inequalities are violated, and Bell's theorem follows by asserting the violation requires non-local connectivity between the two measuring filters that can be space-like separated. Teleportation is deemed possible, and quantum channels are conjectured to connect these two distant particles. How this non-locality is maintained is not presently understood and is called quantum weirdness. Non-locality is universally accepted as evidenced by the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. Entanglement, such as in the singlet state, is believed to persist over space-time, supported by quantum channels. Personally, I reject the concept of non-locality as unfeasible. Entanglement swapping over space-time might be a valid mathematical operation, but in my view, which is consistent with the famous group theorist Longett Higgins, unfeasible mathematical operations don't happen. Indeed, we must trust our intuition, which fundamentally comes down to this. If it does not make physical sense, it is probably wrong. This slide distinguishes between incompatible and complementary observables. Since all we know comes from observation, we apply quantum mechanics to obtain states and Hermitian operators. The more refined our technology, the more accurately we can measure an attribute. Sometimes new experiments are performed and new properties are uncovered. We assign Hermitian operators to all these observables and since combinations can be formed, we refer to a system as having an algebra of observables. We can break these operators up into two general types, those that commute and those that do not commute. When a set of commuting operators are measured, their accuracy is determined by the efficiency of the apparatus and not by nature. We say commuting sets form pure states, which are extremal points on a convex set. All these extremal points are pure states and dispersion-free. Points within the convex set are mixed states. Now, this is not true if the sets do not commute. They cannot simultaneously be dispersion-free, and Heisenberg showed the non-commutation leads to his uncertainty relations. I'll give an example in the next slide. Complementary attributes of a system differ from incompatible attributes only in the fact that the former exists in different spaces, called inverse or reciprocal spaces. This does not play any role for classical systems, because all classical observables commute, and in principle are all simultaneously measured without interfering with each other. Complementary properties of nature were the main reason for the famous Einstein-Bohr debates. It is known that quantum mechanics cannot simultaneously describe two complementary attributes because they exist in complementary, inverse, or reciprocal vector spaces. Bohr asserted that when one is represented, the other does not exist. Einstein showed in his famous EPR paper of 1935, using entangled states, that both position and momentum can exist simultaneously, and therefore quantum mechanics is incomplete. The debate continues today. Experiments today are largely done on particles with spin, 
and coincidence experiments are performed. Complementary properties exemplify the wave-particle duality of quantum mechanics, and here are some examples. Position and momentum, energy and time, angle and angular momentum, all these don't commute. The product of each complementary pair have units of Planck's constant, that is, units of angular momentum. Each commutator gives I times Planck's constant. To measure complementary properties, different experiments must be performed. For example, scattering experiments like X-ray crystallography are done in momentum or K-space, and then the Fourier transform of K-space gives position space and the structure of the crystal. Position and momentum spaces are complementary Fourier spaces. The same is true for time and energy. In the old days, after NMR was first discovered, experiments were done by slowly scanning the frequency and recording the spectral lines that came into resonance. This is called continuous wave or CW experiments. Today, all NMR is done using time pulses. The spins are suddenly polarized with a pulse and then decay, called the free induction decay, or FID. This decay contains a superposition of all the frequencies and can be recorded in a few nanoseconds. Using the technique of fast Fourier transform, the FID is transformed to frequency space. Similar techniques are widely used in science. These transformations relate complementary attributes, one defined in one space and its partner in an inverse space. Measuring two complementary operators requires different experiments, since one experiment is defined in one space, which does not describe the other, which is its inverse space. Note that the three components of angular momentum do not commute, but one component is the superposition of the other. Hence, to measure angular momentum, say, in the z-direction, then to measure the x-direction, the whole apparatus is simply rotated by 90 degrees. No new equipment is needed because they share the same vector space. Hence, these spin components are not complementary. Another way to say this is that the two components are both angular momentum. Certainly, position and k-space, time and frequency are quite different from each other. Since complementary observables have inverse spaces, we can ask what is the complementary property of angular momentum that depends on angle and not the derivative of the angle? It has not been found. There is no known complementary property to quantum angular momentum. However, there must be such a property. But a big problem is that it is not found in the Dirac equation. One purpose of this presentation is to find this property, and for that, we need Q-spin. To motivate this search for the missing complementary property of spin, I will take a detour into geometric algebra. GA extends the usual algebra of functions to quantities that have a geometric structure due to vectors. These vectors can have any dimension but we will be concerned with only three dimensions. With two vectors, you can do three things. You can take the scalar or dot product, and the two vectors become a scalar. You can take a vector cross product, generally called the wedge product, and get another vector. You can take the outer product of two vectors, which produces a dyadic, which is also called the geometric product. The three are related by the following definition from GA, with the anti-commutator of the two vectors giving the scalar product and the commutator of the two giving the wedge product. Like I said, in three dimensions, the wedge product becomes the cross product. This is the most fundamental relationship in geometric algebra. Now let's apply it to two Pauli spin components and write the geometric product as the sum of the anti-commutator and the commutator. 
we know what these are. Look at the anti-commutator. It gives the scalar product. Note that if i is not equal to j, this term is zero. So the only surviving term is i is equal to j. Recall the product of two Pauli matrices is the identity. The anti-commutator gives simply the Kronecker delta function of i equal to j. Now look at the commutator, and the opposite happens. i cannot be equal to j, and so the commutation survives. This is in terms of the Levi-Civita tensor and the bivector. This leads to the following expression, which is a concise way of displaying the geometric properties of the dyadic of Pauli matrices. You can find this discussion in Wikipedia and the Pauli matrices. This relationship sums up the geometric properties of the Pauli matrices. The two parts are complementary. I cannot both be equal and not equal to J. The first term is totally symmetric, and the second term is totally anti-symmetric. Note that a scalar cannot be anti-symmetric. Here I am not talking about pseudo-scalars. The first term describes polarizations, like ket bra of plus plus and minus minus. The second term describes coherences, like ket bra of plus minus or minus plus. The first term is the dot product of the two Pauli matrices. The second term gives the vector cross product between Pauli spin matrices. The first term comes from the vector spin operator sigma. The second comes from a bivector, which is the imaginary number i times sigma. So i sigma k is equal to the product of sigma i times sigma j. This expression is valid for one spin in a two by two vector space. It is not valid for the tensor product between different spins. In spin calculations, the dyadic comes up a lot, but since we only measure the polarization, we can never see the effects from the anti-symmetric term. Only the first symmetric term is directly observable, which is the spin's polarization. The conclusion is that this expression includes the anti-symmetric part, but this term is not included as a property of spin. Spin is only described by the up-down polarization due to sigma. To see this, work out the expectation value of a spin, which is defined as the trace over the state or density operator with sigma. This describes a state of polarization in the z direction. Plug in these and separate the traces. The Pauli spin matrices are traceless, and so this term drops out. We are left with the geometric product, or dyadic, sigma, sigma. The trace is easily done by putting in the indices, and we end up with the z component of A and the expectation value. The point is the dyadic contains both the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts, but the anti-symmetric part never survives the trace. To remedy this, we add the anti-symmetric part to its description. In addition to the Pauli spin vector, define the hyperhelicity, which is a second rank, totally anti-symmetric tensor in terms of the bivector. This is the complementary property to spin polarization. Then the definition of spin changes from what we had before. The spin vector of one half h bar times sigma includes now the property of helicity as well as polarization. We call this quaternion or q spin. Before discussion of q spin, there is a problem that the Dirac equation does not display a bivector. To include it, I change one of the gamma matrices, and this changes the signature or metric tensor. This is the usual Dirac equation, and the signature has one for time and minus one for the three spatial components. This is Minkowski spacetime. 
the spatial gamma matrices display two spins on the skew diagonal. These are what Dirac took as the matter-antimatter pair. I will now add the bivector. To include the bivector, I must multiply gamma 2 by the imaginary number and define gamma tilde, which becomes Hermitian. Therefore, the modified Dirac equation, called the Quaternion equation, now becomes non-Hermitian. The subscript S describes spin spacetime. Since spin now has structure, it can have any orientation in Minkowski spacetime. The spatial components in spin spacetime are just a rotation away from the laboratory fixed frame in Minkowski spacetime. Note the signature has changed due to gamma tilde, and the two plus ones are timelike, and the two minus ones are spatial terms. The new plus one describes the spinning frequency or the helicity. The Dirac and Quaternion equations give very different results. By introducing the bivector, the Dirac equation becomes non-Hermitian. Now, in an isotropic environment, like in free flight, the one and three polarization axes are indistinguishable. Introduce a permutation operator, which is a parity operator. This permutes the one and three labels. Note that the bivector is odd to this parity, so the quaternion equation has two solutions. In working these out, Note that permuting the 1, 3 axes shows that the two states are reflections of each other, and they do not have definite parity. These are the two mirror states which Dirac found. This also leads to identifying two complementary spaces needed for the complementary properties. This small change to the gamma matrices gives a structured spin and separate spin spacetime into two distinct spaces. In free flight, the 1 and 3 axes are indistinguishable, but the bivector is not. Permutation by this parity operator P13 does not change the 1, 3 dependence of the Dirac equation, but the bivector is antisymmetric to this permutation, and this leads to a non-Hermitian Dirac equation, and the solutions are mirror states just like Dirac found. These mirror states are reflected under the permutation of the 1, 3 axes. The mirror states are in a right-handed and a left-handed coordinate frame. Recall that the gamma matrices now have a subscript S, which denotes spin spacetime. Each structured particle can be oriented differently, and each needs its own body-fixed frame. We do not need a spin spacetime for a point particle. We need it for a structured particle. By introducing the bivector, the SU2 symmetry of the Dirac equation is changed. Whereas Dirac spin has three spatial magnetic components, by changing to the bivector, we have only two. These are indicated here, which shows that the two axes form a plane giving the reflective states. The bivector orients that plane in three-dimensional space and is the origin of the helicity. However, we can add and subtract the two mirror states, and this leads to the separation of space-time into two parts, one for the spin polarization of even parity and the other for the complementary property, the helicity, of odd parity. From this figure, you can visualize that when two reflective states are added, the bivector cancels, and when they are subtracted, the two spatial components cancel. This leads to the separation of the non-Hermitian Dirac equation into two distinct equations of odd and even parity. The two complementary spaces of spin are found. The even parity polarization states and the odd to parity coherent states. I will state the solutions. 
The equation for the odd parity state is a massless while spinner, which has no time component. Time is left in the even parity states, which give now a two-dimensional, and not three-dimensional, Dirac equation. With no time, the while equations have no boosts, and so the solution is a unit quaternion. You can find this in Schroeder and Perskin. This equation spins the axis of linear motion and therefore generates the helicity with precession frequency of chi. The solution to the 2D Dirac equation is the same as the usual three-dimensional Dirac equation, but with only two spatial components, which are orthogonal mirror states. These become a two-dimensional Klein-Gordon equation with two solutions with different energies. One is the positive, and the other is the infamous negative energy. P1 and P3 are the relativistic momentum associated with the two orthogonal spatial axes. This creates a disk, or 2D plane, of magnetic polarization, which is spun by the helicity. Recall, 2D quantum systems can display any ions. We now have two spaces, polarization in a 2D plane, and helicity from the quaternion. Quaternions exist in the S3 hypersphere, with four spatial dimensions and beyond our own space-time. Again, polarization and helicity are complementary properties. One is a spinning plane, and the other spins that plane. The space-time diagram here displays the relationship between Minkowski space-time and spin space-time. Spin space-time breaks up into two spaces, the 2D plane of polarization of even parity states, and the S3 hypersphere for the quaternions that spin the axis, and these have odd parity. Since the gravity of a tiny spin is negligible, Minkowski space-time is flat. The anti-emission space of quaternions is not in our space-time, but in the fourth-dimensional hypersphere, S3. We cannot see it all. All we can see is the stereographic projection of the spinning 2D plane. We cannot observe the full quaternion space, but this treatment shows that nature extends beyond our dimensions. The spinning is generated from the hypersphere. The wild solution only spins the axis in free flight. Upon reaching an anisotropic environment, the helicity is destroyed and stops, and the polarization is manifest. Recall this is the wave-particle duality and an example of complementarity. Helicity is the wave, polarization is the particle. The body fixed frame of the 2D spin has unit vectors E1 and E3. The laboratory fixed frame in Minkowski space-time is XYZ. Take the linear momentum perpendicular to the axis of linear momentum so that E2 is equal to Y, and this is the axis that spins. Now I can discuss the 2D Dirac equation. The two orthogonal spin axes are mirror states. The two-dimensional polarization plane is the sum of the two mirror states as shown. As mirror states, they must reflect each other, so they are shown precessing oppositely to maintain their reflective property. The two mirror states of one-half spin lie along the E3 and the E1 axes, and these couple to give a completely resonant spin of magnitude 1. This is like a photon. Even more so, there is no zero component for this spin. The two axes spinning oppositely generate, say, a spin component of m equals plus 1. Reversing both gives the component of m equals minus 1. But to form the m equals zero component would violate the mirror property, so it cannot form. Note that a photon has no m equals zero component either. Going back to expressing the spin dyadic in terms of the polarization and coherence changes spin from being in a polarized state of sigma 
to also having its complementary coherent terms expressed by the bivector. As defined earlier, the capital sigma denotes each spin as a quaternion spin. In this line, the expectation values are given, which are simple to work out. I did an example a few slides ago. The result in the body fixed frame and gives a phase factor of pi over 4. Now, using the polarizations as a sum of mirror states means that the sum of the three and one axes, normalized by root 2, forms the resonance spin of 1 by the vector coupling of the two spins of 1 half. The two axes are shifted by pi over 4. I'll come back to this on the next slide. Here I want to point out that the mirror states process oppositely, so they are always in phase, dictated by their mirror symmetry. The quantum field theory treatment, which follows from Dirac's C of electron model, gives two terms which are treated as the matter-antimatter twins. So there is still a problem with the negative energy of the second term. In the case of quaternion spin, the two axes spin on the same particle, so there is no problem with the negative energy being minus infinity, since the two just balance or compensate each other. Quaternion spin appears to solve the negative energy problem of the Dirac equation. Look at this from the body fix frame, and note that the resonance spin of 1 has two parts that are shifted by pi over 4. E3 is rotated to the right by pi over 4, and E1 to the left, so they lie on top of each other and form the spin of 1. If the signs of the resonance spin are permuted, we get four possible resonance spins as bisectors of the body fixed frame. In free flight, only the resonance spin is present. The two axes are superposed. Recall again that the resonance spin is averaged to zero by the helicity, but nonetheless the two spins of one half in free flight move towards the filter in a state of a spin equals one, or a boson. The main result here is for Q spin, which is now in the laboratory fixed frame. Since experiments are done in the laboratory fixed frame, we must transform from the body fixed to the laboratory fixed frame using these relations. Recall that E2 equals Y, so that the filters and the spin plane are coplanar. Note also that the filter direction is included. The field and spin are rotated from each other by angles theta and theta A, as seen from the transformation. The first line shows two unit quaternions. It is easy to work out the dot product between the field vectors A and the E3 and E1 vectors, and with a bit of algebra we get the final result. The second line shows the result after transforming to the laboratory fixed frame, which displays the two spin axes which are now projected into the laboratory fixed frame. The first line is an exponential quaternion, and since quaternions form products, it can be written as the geometric factor times a field quaternion. These are both unit quaternions. The second line writes this to display the two axes. After transformation, the first axis is the E3 axis as viewed from the laboratory fixed frame, while the second term is the E1 axis as viewed from the laboratory fixed frame. These depend upon the local variable's theta, which orients the spin in the laboratory fixed frame. The laboratory fixed frame equations are the most important here and describe quaternion spin. We think of a spin one-half as a polarized quantity, like a bar magnet pointing up or down. Here we find spin displays wave-particle duality. In free flight, it acts like a wave, and when measured, it acts like a particle. A spin is similar to a photon in free flight. It is a wave, and upon encountering a field, it acts like a particle. Formulating the wave nature of spin one-half is a new feature of this work. 
It shows the wave nature of a spin is actually spinning of the axis due to a quaternion, like the helicity of a photon. It has two axes of spin polarization perpendicular to the direction of linear momentum, analogous to the electric and magnetic components of a photon. These two spin around their axes. In free flight, these two spin axes of one half couple to give a spin of magnitude one, again like a photon, which has a spin one as well. This spin one has only plus or minus one components and with no zero components, again like a photon. Upon encountering a field, the particle nature emerges. Like emission and absorption of the energy by a photon, so a spin one half displays similar behavior after the two magnetic states are split by the Zeeman effect. When a free flight spin encounters a field or filter, the wave nature stops and the spin evolves into the usual spin one half that we observe. It is this transition from wave to particle that is responsible for the violation of Bell's inequalities. The mechanism for this violation is how that free flight spin of one decouples into the usual spin one half we observe. This is far from the usual explanation that declares the process is due to non-locality and its associated quantum weirdness. I will now summarize the main points of this talk. Observed spin has two states of up and down. These are the polarized states of even parity. Measured spin is a fermion of a spin one half. A spin in free flight displays no net polarization and it only spins around its axis. These are the coherent states of odd parity like ket bra plus minus minus plus. Quaternions cannot be observed. Free flight spin is a boson of spin one. The two epitomize the wave particle duality of spin. The most basic equation that describes the complementary properties of spin is the geometric product of the two Pauli spin components. The first term is symmetric and describes polarizations. The second term is antisymmetric and describes coherence. To describe the coherence, a bivector is needed. This is not in the Dirac equation. To include a bivector in the Dirac equation, the symmetry must be changed from SU2 to the quaternion group Q8. When the symmetry is the quaternion group, spin spacetime breaks up into two distinct complementary spaces. Polarization space is the 2D disk of polarization formed from the two orthogonal magnetic moments. The two magnetic moments couple in free flight to give a spin of one, the boson, and it is purely coherent. In a field, the two axes decouple, and one axis lines up with the field and the other randomizes. The measured spin is a fermion with a spin of one half. A spin undergoes a transition from a boson to a fermion when measured. Dirac found two spins in his 4x4 field, a matter and an antimatter pair. This is replaced by two axes on the same particle. Q spin resolves a negative energy problem of the second spin. Q spin is geometrically equivalent to a photon. Q spin is one particle in a four dimensional Dirac field, not two. Two dimensional systems like Q spin admit anions. The violation of Bell's inequalities is due to the boson in free flight decoupling to a fermion when measured. Non locality is not needed to account for the violation. Intrinsic angular momentum of spin becomes extrinsic.